Okay, good evening. I'm Ali. And I'm Claire. And thanks for tuning in. This is Decoding Decisions, Making Sense of the Messy Middle. So what is the messy middle? Well, if you cast your minds back 20 years, so we're talking pre-smartphone, pre-internet, purchases were largely determined by the physical availability of a product and the information available to you at the time. But today, the sheer volume of choice and information online makes this far more complex. So using screen captured video and audio, we've watched literally hundreds of hours of shopping journeys. And today's journey looks something more like this. Now this spaghetti-like space between the trigger and the purchase itself is what we call the messy middle. Now this might look a little bit silly, but it actually makes a serious point. So like I said, we've watched hundreds of hours of shopping behavior. And we've seen consumers go from search engines to review sites, to video sharing sites, to aggregators, to help me out here, Claire. There's also social media, comparison sites, forums, blog sites even. And the list goes on and on. So actually this model is probably quite accurate. And we had a hunch that all of this complexity wasn't being fully addressed by our uh, current marketing models and possibly even our marketing practices. Now, while this model makes a point, this is, of course, completely useless to all of us. This behavior needs to be codified and it needs to be organized. So before we sort out Ali's spaghetti, it's important to note that all decisions happen against this backdrop of exposure. So it's not a completely new concept. You may know it as awareness, but exposure is so much more than awareness. It can be as big as, as a billboard that you pass on a freeway, but equally it can be as small as a conversation you overhear in a coffee shop. It's always on, importantly, it's always changing, and it remains present at every single stage of the model. So what we've done with all those behaviors that we listed earlier is codify them in two distinct mental modes, exploration and evaluation. So these two things, they can happen sequentially, they can happen simultaneously, but the research and the science has really shown us that these two functions are distinct and they involve different mental processes. So what we've learned is that exploration is an expansive exercise. So here we're adding new brands, new products into our consideration set. And then as we update our prior understanding with all this new information, it needs to be evaluated. And this is very much a reductive exercise. Now, with the sheer amount of choice and all of this information that's readily available at our fingertips at all times, it's rare that we'll just go around this loop once, right? And it's no coincidence that this looks like an infinity loop. I won't even tell you how long it took me to pick out this one gray curtain behind me. Now, if you do manage, very nice. you like my gray, thank you. I do, I do. Now, if you do manage to make a decision, which I eventually did, you'll head to purchase and your experience will feed back into exposure. So not just your own exposure, but also the exposure of others should you choose to share your experience. Right, okay, so we explore and we evaluate and the messy middle is now uh, a lot neater, I guess, but the job is only half done because in this world full of so much choice and information, we need to understand how humans manage these mental functions. And what we've learned is that when we're faced with so much choice, we default to cognitive mechanisms that actually evolved deep within our pre-digital uh, history and mechanisms that of course have been well documented by behavioral scientists. So, in parallel to all of our shopping observations, we conducted a literature review of the decades of behavioral science research. And from the 300 or so cognitive biases and principles, we picked out six that we feel often have a significant or a disproportionate impact as consumers navigate this messy middle. But before we get, on in, uh, before we get into that, a quick word on some boundaries. There's no brand strategy here. Okay, and equally, price is off the table. Now, these things are hugely important, but they're not so easily changed. Okay, but that leaves us with this eminently playable space in the middle where executing some of these biases requires sometimes just a cosmetic change or maybe just uh, reprioritizing some existing content. So right. our six chosen biases are... They are, we'll start with category heuristics. So these are essentially shortcuts that help us make decisions. So this is, for example, you're in the supermarket shopping for food and you see the word organic stamped on an item. And this tells you several things about this item just in that one word. We also have the authority bias. And this is around the fact that we like following the lead of credible or knowledgeable experts in that particular field. OK, so one example here that I like is it's just like a central bank telling you that the housing market will never collapse. Right. 
So there's also scarcity. Uh, probably a lot of you are familiar with this, right? The more scarce something is, the more appealing and desirable it is to us. Okay, so a typical example here is you're booking a hotel online and you can see that it only has three rooms left. We also have the power of free, and this is that disproportionate pull that that word free has. Yeah, and we all love a freebie, and sometimes this, this freebie doesn't have anything to do with the product itself. Then there's social proof. This is also called the herd instinct and really about the fact that we look to what others think or what they're doing. So the common execution is a five-star review when we're shopping online. And finally, we have the power of now. So evolutionarily, we're wired to really live in the present, really living in the here and now. And I like this one because it explains why perhaps I'm not very good at going on a diet or saving money. But if you tell me I can have something that I've ordered tomorrow, then this really has a huge appeal for me. So those are our six qualities. There's nothing new there. But what we've done what we're going to do is systematically test and validate these at scale. And the way we've done that is in a simulated purchase environment, okay? So we've picked out 31 products, and these products represent a range of different levels of complexity and different levels of risk. And we've recruited 1,000 in-market shoppers for each of these products, and each shopper did 10 simulations. So that gives us a total of 310,000 simulated purchase scenarios. How much? <laughs> 310,000 simulated purchases. It's a big number. Right. Go on, get on with it. Get on with it. All right. Now, before we started the simulation, we asked shoppers to tell us what their favorite brand is and also what their second favorite brand is. And then we've used these six biases to try and tempt the shopper away from their favorite brand to what at least they perceive to be an inferior brand. And it turns out that you don't actually need all the fix to do this. And as an example, we're going to take a quick look at the simulation for mortgages. Now, this is a fiercely competitive market and it's a big risky purchase. So it actually makes a very good case study. So this is what the simulation looks like. So we house it in a debranded retail environment and we have the favorite brand on the left hand side, the second favorite brand on the right. And then in these smaller boxes, we execute the six different biases that we picked out in our literature review. And now what we can do is we can then chop and change these and we're able to quantify the impact of this in the controlled environment. That's right. So at the start of the simulation, the shopper gives us their favorite brand. And in that one fleeting top of mind moment, that brand enjoys, we can say, 100% share of the preference. But then we start the simulation. And the first thing we do is just to quantify the presence of that second choice brand on a level playing field. So here you can see both propositions are identical. The only difference is the brand. But it turns out that just by showing up at the right time, that second choice brand has taken a third of the share of preference. Okay, but that's just the start because now we're gonna take that second choice brand and we're gonna charge it. And we do that by giving it superior executions for two out of the six cognitive biases, okay? So we're gonna start by providing some powerful shortcuts, some powerful shortcuts for the heuristics. But the highlight here is we're going to give that second choice brand a 500 pound cashback as part of its proposition versus a free valuation for the favorite brand. Now, given that this is a typically large uh, and very long, like 25 year long loan, if we were as rational as I guess classical economics economists would have us believe, then this really shouldn't make much of a difference. But it does. So now over half of shoppers have switched from their favorite brand to their second choice brand. Now that really is the power of free. That is the power of free. So but now we're not going to stop there, of course. We're going to throw the book at it quite literally. We're going to supercharge that second choice brand. And now we're going to do that across all six of these cognitive biases. We haven't got time to go through them all. But some of the highlights here are the five-star review that we've given the second choice brand, which provides increased social proof instead of just three stars for the favorite. We're also going to add in a more powerful source of authority bias or a more powerful source of authority for that second choice brand. Right. So now we have that second choice brand. It's supercharged. And with that being supercharged, three quarters of shoppers have now switched to that second choice brand. So really, this is a really powerful demonstration of how humans default to these mechanisms when managing choice and information in the messy middle. It is worth remembering, though, that that second choice brand, although it is technically the second favorite, it's still a powerful brand. But what happens when we remove that power from the equation? 
Well, this is Plus Building Society. Okay, now you've never heard of this brand. The reason why you've never heard of it is because we've conjured it out of thin air. This is a researcher's idea of, of fun. No, this is Ali's idea of fun. Okay, yeah, maybe it's just my idea of fun. Thanks, Claire. Um, but what we've done here is effectively we've removed the exposure element from the equation. Okay, so this brand has zero equity. Okay, but we've supercharged it just like we did for that second favorite brand, and then we've put it up against the market leaders. Now, alarmingly, or perhaps, you know, excitingly, depending on your perspective, when supercharged, this plus building society has acquired nearly two thirds share of preference from that favorite brand. Okay, quick point here though, even with a weaker proposition, over a third stuck with their favorite brand. So you can see brands really still are all powerful, but in a world of this, you know, abundant information and choice, we're just showing that there are other powerful factors at play here as well. Okay, so now we're going to look at the same simulation for all 31 products. And we're going to sum up by making three points in three charts in under three minutes. Okay, so firstly, simply showing up can impact decisions in the messy middle. What you're seeing here is all 31 products. The blue is the first choice brand. The yellow is the second choice brand. And consistently across all 31 of these products, all a competitor had to do to take significant share of preference was just to show up. Now, the second point is all about intelligent use of behavioral science principles in the messy middle. So here, again, we're looking at those 31 products, but in this case, it's after we've charged that second choice brand with superior executions for two of the six biases. Now, small changes obviously can have a big impact, and as we've seen with that mortgage example, it's really not always an entirely rational discovery that determines the outcome. And then finally, very quickly, by understanding human behavior in this way, we can close the gap between trigger and purchase in the messy middle. Now, we saw this with Plus Building Society, but of course, we didn't stop there. We created another 30 fake brands to take on the market leaders. And what you're looking at here is the simulation results after we had fully supercharged all of those fake brands. Now, it's worth noting that a fake brand in our simulation is a pretty good proxy for a new challenger in the real world. And if that seems far-fetched, it's worth remembering that marketing history is littered with stories of challenger brands that seemingly came out of nowhere and took a significant share of the market. Okay, so hopefully we've made some sense of the messy middle. The full research will be available in mid-July in an ebook, so please do check it out. And all that's left to say is thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> that's the sound of our nut stock viewers having just watched you guys blow up everything they thought they knew about brand love you're telling us that you can create a fictional brand as a challenger brand and go head to head and by pulling a few heuristic and cognitive bias levers you've completely reshaped the landscape come on <laughs> Okay, okay, don't worry. I think everyone can stop having heart attacks because we're not, we're definitely not saying that brands aren't, aren't important, right? So it's actually the opposite. The brand is probably the single most powerful heuristic in our test, right? So what, what gives you all that important head start in the first place? Um, and I think, you know, what we've seen is that even with that weaker proposition, right? So when that favorite brand has the, those inferior executions of behavioral science, some of these brands are still hanging on to a huge, you know, quite significant chunk of customers when they're up against that supercharged alternative. Mm -hmm. And when you charge or supercharge the favorite brand, it becomes really all powerful. Yeah, that's right. And just to, just to follow on from that point, Claire, it's, we mustn't forget that brands represent a really significant invest of time and resource and all that creative energy. But what the research is telling us is that given that a competitor needs only show up at the right time to acquire some share, there's a good chance that we may not be getting the optimal return on that investment. So at what we're saying is, is to use these insights to strengthen your brand in the messy middle, protect your customers, avoid that competitive disruption and get a better return on those big brand investments. Brand and is and one question that came up in, in prior uh, sessions about not just the overarching umbrella of cognitive biases and heuristics that have an impact on all humans, but individuals may be wired slightly differently and more susceptible to certain things. Were you finding any evidence of that? Yeah, it was quite interesting, actually. We did do a segmentation, just a natural segmentation, to see how it would naturally fall out in terms of which respondents had um, you know, selected which, which biases within our simulation. 
And one of the natural breakouts was actually for a particularly younger demographic. Social proof tended to be uh, more important to them than the median, uh, as well as power of now, right? So you can imagine that younger generation really conditioned to you know, be quite impatient. They're, they're used to getting things quickly. So power of now was, was quite important to that uh, particular demographic. Yeah, and I, I guess we'd make the point also that, that the executions that we've used in our simulated purchase, none of these are recommendations, right? There's there's no recommendations here. What we're doing is demonstrating how powerful these things can be in a simulated environment. And then the recommendation is to take this and build your own execution based on your markets, based on your particular segments and your customers, and then see what is uh, most effective in that context. Context is so powerful in behavioral science studies, and including creating reproducibility issues on occasion because you're not in the same context. And while uh, simulations and lab experiments are, are rife, there is some criticism about this kind of clinical approach that it's not really in the context of somebody distractedly walking along in the street, you know, with their search engine on their, their mobile. Is there any merit to thinking that there would be a different outcome in a messier environment in terms of context? Yeah, I, I fully expect and hope that there is, because not only is it messier, I mean, you've got to remember that the executions in our simulation are terribly bland, right? It's just black and white text. And if imagine if you, you know, you, know you, you throw some creative energy behind that, what you can do to really amplify the effects of those biases. Again, it's, it comes back to what the, the previous point we made. All this should be is merely provocation for going and doing real live in market testing in your own markets because yes because of the effects that it was a simulated environment yes because our creative application was incredibly weak it had to be to, to, to simulate it in a controlled environment but really it's about it's about doing your own tests in market to make up for the, any shortcomings that our simulation might have what our simulation shows is just how fluid decision making can be when there is so much information and so much choice and last question, this was really about brands and products or implied products. Would it work for issues, do you think, when you think about health-related issues or you think about um, whether we should stay in or reopen or are we reopening too quickly? Should we vaccinate our kids? I mean, do you think there's an issue test here that could be done? So are we speaking about so what in, in terms of COVID, in terms of lockdown and, and, and that kind of context? Yeah, that, that could be well, one I of think, them, yes. Yeah, so I, I think the, the model we presented, for example, is I think more important now in the context of COVID. So the middle is essentially messier. We've accelerated it. Lots of digital behavior has been accelerated. And we're now seeing more exploration. We're seeing more evaluation. You can see clues to this on, uh, on Google Trends. For example, you see that the way people are searching suggests that they are doing more exploration, they're doing more value evaluation. And we think exposure is more important too. And of course, like Google has played, in terms of search, has played a very non-commercial role uh, as well in disseminating COVID information. So we've seen, uh, we've, you know, we've got access to a lot of data on that. But really, I think if it's worth going on Google Trends and exploring all that, uh, I suggest that to the whole audience to go and do that because you know we've captured a lot of really interesting behaviour that really tells a story during uh, during the COVID crisis. Claire, Ali, both of Google, thanks so much for bringing that to us and great stuff for others to now take on board and begin to test. Appreciate that. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. Very welcome. And thank you.